Yes, we can go ahead and think about getting started here. Gary, would you mind opening for a word of prayer again this morning? Thank you. I know we bother. We thank you for the uh, time and the gather to take in your word and for uh, Jim taking the time to put this all together for us. Appreciate Ben taking over the class last week. I wasn't sure if I was going to be here or not. Turned out, obviously, I was, but um, I was going to be gone. I, I wasn't going to know till the last minute, and I didn't want to dump it on somebody at the last minute. So, he, uh, looking at at some things pertaining to how Satan does what he does, why he does things the way he does. It. Go back to Second Corinthians chapter four again. We've looked at this a couple of times. <clears throat> using this as a springboard to uh, get into the main <clears throat> emphasis of our study. And we actually won't have, to, won't be spending a whole lot of time on the main emphasis of this just because um, I don't think we'll, I don't think we'll have to, to understand what God's saying about this, but in second Corinthians, actually, if we start in chapter three, verse 18, this whole whole section pertains to what we're looking at. Chapter 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18 says, And we all, with unveiled face, reflecting the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice clever uh, cleverness or to tamper with uh, God's word, but by the open manifestation of the truth would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of the Christ, who is the image of God. So here we have a direct statement as to uh, one aspect of Satan's, one important for aspect of Satan's methodology is he blinds minds. And this word minds, if you remember, it, it's a word that refers to the conclusions that a person comes to after mulling something over. You draw a conclusion for something, and this is what Satan tampers with. He tampers with the conclusions we come to, how he does this, uh, who knows. Uh, but it's like slipping a, a monkey wrench into the cogs of a gear to, to uh, mess the, the machine up that's that's running flawlessly. And you throw something in there, it clogs the gears up, and it, you end up with something that's not functioning the way it ought to, or the end result is not what it was designed to do. And that's what Satan does with our conclusions. <clears throat> and we have in verse, verse 3 this word, if. If our gospel is veiled, and it is, there's no uncertainty as whether it is hidden or not. Uh, it is, it's a it's a clear, uh, unquestionable fact that this is hidden. But what is often questioned is what this gospel is that is hidden. And this gospel that is hidden, I don't believe is referring to the gospel of salvation, 
what he's talking about is this good news that he begins talking about in verse 18 of chapter 3. This good news is that we, our faces have been unveiled. This, this truth is not veiled to us. It's been unveiled to those who are perishing, those who are unbelievers, but it's been unveiled to us. And because it's been unveiled to us, we can actually see that there is a work in progress in our lives at the present time that is right now, right at this moment, transforming us into uh, God's image. It's a work in us right now. It's not something we have to wait for to look for in the future, although the completion of that is in the future. It's something we can appreciate, we can uh, revel in, we can uh, cooperate with right here and now with this transformation process. <clears throat> and that is good news. And <clears throat> this transformation is uh, a work of God uh, here in verse uh, 18 of chapter 3. This, the Holy Spirit is being emphasized <clears throat> as uh, one who's uh, instrumental in participating in this, but we see that uh, the the uh, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to here in verse eighteen with all unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. I believe that's probably referring to Jesus Christ, although it could be referring to all three persons of the Godhead because they would all be in, included in this. But the image we're being transformed into is the glorified, resurrected Lord in his humanity. That's what we're being transformed into. So this glory of the Lord, I believe, is probably talking about the person of Christ. And then in chapter 4, uh, verse uh, 1, uh, no, verse, verse 2, we have uh, renounced the graceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice clever uh, cleverness or tamper with God's word, open manifestation of the truth. Uh, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience, the sight of God. Both these places where this word God, this title God, theos is used, we have the definite article. So we have here refer two references to God the Father. So in this short span, uh, we have reference to all three persons of the Godhead being involved in this transfer, uh, transformation process in some capacity. And this transformation process is what <clears throat> this... The, that's the good news for us. And that's what uh, these unsaved people, that's what they're blinded to. They're blinded to the fact, not that there, so much of this transformation is taking place, although I do believe that that's part of it. But what they're being uh, blinded to is the fact that what he says here at the end of verse 18 of chapter three, this comes from the Lord, the spirit of the Lord. This transformation is something that can only be accomplished by God. It can't be imitated. It can't be substituted. It can't, you can't come in close to it. It's something that is completely done by the Lord. And that's what he says here within in verse, uh, uh, verse uh, two of chapter four, when he says that we have renounced disgraceful underhanded ways. We refuse to practice uh, cunning or cleverness. Uh, gimmicks is how I might look at this. We don't use gimmicks to peddle the word or to tamper with the word with the Father's word, but by open manifestation of the truth. The truth looks back to the fact that this is from the Lord. Only the Lord can make this transformation occur. And this is what Satan is blinding the minds of unbelievers to is the fact that, uh, well, we don't have the phrase here, but we have it mentioned back in Romans chapter one, if you want to go back there briefly, we have a contrast between this truth, the truth, and what Satan is doing. He says in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, it says they exchanged the truth about the God, the truth concerning the fact that there is only one God. <clears throat> uh, they exchanged the truth for the lie. And that lie, referring back to obviously Satan's lie in the garden to, to Eve, that um, you can be like God. And so you have uh, two, two uh, statements here, the truth, the lie. And in those four words, you have the, uh, just a, a, an abbreviation of a vast amount of, of scripture contained in those two, those two little doctrines, the truth and the lie. You have the lie, which Satan is trying to uh, counterfeit what God is doing. And the fact that Satan says, you don't need God to do this. You can do this by yourself goes back to his statement in Isaiah says that he would be he would make himself like God and that's the lie he's peddling to you you can make yourself like God too but that sounds 
on the surface, not, uh, that it's not a lie because God himself says you're being transformed into the image of God. So Satan says you can be like God. And God says he's transforming you into the image of God. So it was, why is one the truth and one a lie? One's the truth because God says that transformation can only take place if God is, is making it happen. Only God can do it. Satan's lie comes in, and that's where we get independence from God, says, because Satan says, you can do it, you, you can be, yeah, you can be transformed to the image of God, but you don't need God to do it. You can do it, uh, well, I've, I've got some, some ideas for you, <laughs> okay? You can do it without God, and I've got some clever ways that, that we can manipulate to show you that, that God is really trying to hide some stuff from you, uh, and that uh, there, there's some things that I have available to you if you embrace uh, what what I my methodology uh, you can get the same result without having to submit to all this stuff that God uh, wants you to bend over to. So that's why uh, Satan has the lie. Satan says you can do it without God. Uh, God says you can only do it by God. So you have these two contrasting views, and Satan is trying to <clears throat> to peddle this. And he says, you know, going back to Second Corinthians four. Yeah. Um. If in verse 3, the gospel there is the gospel of truth, the gospel of salvation, wouldn't that verse be teaching that, I mean, if it's the gospel of the truth, and it's veiled to those who are perishing, well, the people that are unbelievers can't see the divine um provision anyway so how could they be veiled to that i mean it doesn't make sense to me um, well I, I i believe what they're being veiled to is the fact that uh, i i think that in some cases they can see this and we're going to get to that later on here that's why i'm jumping ahead here but but Peter addresses this and says, uh, be and ready to obviously, give Obviously, there's lots of Christians that don't know that doctrine. Mm -hmm. So are they Christian? Because. No. Um, it means they're ignorant of it. But, but it says if it's, it's failed to go to it's, it's been a, It's been unveiled to them. They may not, they may not um, embrace it. They may not um, uh, learn what it is but it, they have the capacity to know what it is because they have the, it's been unveiled to them they have the capacity to learn it uh, the unsaved has been veiled to them supernaturally they have a they have blinders put over their eyes god's ripped that blinders off but it doesn't mean that they they embrace it automatically because they may not be taught what that truth is okay uh, and and we're going to get to this later on here because this is where we're, we're going with this is what method satan used what method satan uses to blind and he blinds both uh, the the unsaved and he uses those same methods on Christians and Christians become blinded to some of the stuff because they they embrace Satan's methods and so uh, God has given them the capacity to see but Christians many Christians em endorse Satan's methodology and uh, become blind to this truth because they embrace Satan's lie and so they're trying to do this themselves and this is where legalism this is why legalism is such a um, insidious doctrine because this is largely what the lie is composed of is the fact that you can do this yourself through this uh, rig rigorous discipline and christians endorse that and so they're they're blind to the fact that only god can do this because they're trying to do it themselves so it's it's a self-induced blindness but they're they're endorsing satan's methodology if that makes any sense uh, you know, I, would just, I would just say i think the problem is i agree with leslie that it seems like the gospel he's talking about there seems to be a gospel that you're giving unsafe people. I think the problem is solved in understanding that the truth isn't, isn't just for one thing. The truth is not just for freedom. It's not just for victory. The truth, if you're an unsafe person, the truth is God's the only one that can save you. And over here, for the believer, God's the only one that can save you. Still the same, still in the end. It's still okay. the, same. the point I want to make is that salvation is not just initial salvation we're talking about. That salvation is a complete salvation that includes our present tense salvation, which I think Paul's emphasizing here, but it includes initial salvation for sure. So an unsaved person, they, they never see that. They think that their initial salvation is by their works, and they think that you are being a good person by your own good works. For sure. Yeah. And so they're oh, blinded so to the fact that... I can see. Yeah, see, they're because blinded to the fact that only God can do that. about entering the rest and keeping on believing. Mm -hmm. 
not just for reading your initial salvation, but believing for every aspect of your life. Yeah. See, they're blinded to the fact that only God can be can be doing this. And so, anyway, um, did that did that answer? Not totally. Not totally. Not okay. <laughs> this word we're looking at here, this uh, has blinded in verse, um, it's a verse two, verse three. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this this age has blinded. And this, this word blinded, it's interesting because it's in an aorist aorist verb, which refers to a, a uh, completed action. Uh, we usually use a past tense in the English to uh, translate it because, well, that's the best way we could understand it. If something's completed, it's something's already done, so we look, look at it as the past. Uh, the Greek looks at it as a, what they call it, punctiliar action. It, it's something that's, that looks at a point in time. It, it's not something that's an ongoing process. It looks at a, at a point in time, but it looks at the fact that it's been completed. But this point in time uh, doesn't necessarily indicate how long a duration of time it is. This point in time can be something that occurred in an instant. This point in time can be something that took a process of time. It could be taking a, a few months or a few years to look at that in a little bit here. But the point is that this uh, this blinding, it indicates here, is a completed action. It's something that Satan did, did to these individuals or does on a, on a regular basis, blinds them. And, and it's something he does once once for an individual that has continuous action. So it so it has a it's a it's a complete action where they have been blinded. But it says that they are in verse, uh, where's my verse here? In verse, uh, I just came down here because I lost my, my, my participles here. In, in verse three, where it says our gospel is veiled, these, these, this veiling is a participle, which it, and it's used in a, a perfect uh, passive tense, which indicates this is a, something that happened in the past, but it has continuing results. So the blinding is something that was a completed action, but the participle indicates that that completed action now has continuing, uh, there's effects from that. The blinding was a completed action, but that complete blinding now has continuous results in that they are they are uh, continually being this, this truth is continually being hid from them because there was a complete blinding took place and it was, it's a completed action so the question is what action did satan do to blind their minds the conclusions that they come to what was it was it something that happened in an instant of time is it something that took a process of time? Uh, he doesn't say right here what that action is, and I would I would suspect that that's probably different in everybody's case. Um, and we're going to look at some possibilities here. But uh, there's there's three questions that I have from this. Is first of all, how does Satan blind do this? How do, how does this occur? How how does he uh, how does he do this blinding? Squirrel. I'm sorry. Yeah. Squirrel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ultimately, that's exactly that, that's a part of it. It's not all of it, but it's part of it. Uh, when does he do it? And what are they blinded to? Well, that's what we've been discussing in part here, what they're blinded to. <clears throat> uh, this last question, I want to on, touch on just a couple more points of this, and this what they're blinded to. I'm emphasizing the, the present tense salvation of this because I, I, I completely agree that this involves initial salvation too, because that's what uh, God addressed back in the parable of the sower in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All three gospels have that. Matthew emphasizes the gospel in relationship to, uh, actually the parable in relationship to the kingdom of the heavens. Mark and Luke emphasize that parable as its relationship to the kingdom of God. One deals with uh, the uh, mystery form of the kingdom from heavens. The other, the mystery, the uh, kingdom from God deals with God's rule over salvation. And I think that that's what he would be emphasizing here is that uh, when the seed is sown, Satan snatches that seed that is sown uh, so that they can't hear that gospel. Whatever they hear is distorted. And so whatever, if, if they hear it at all, uh, they hear a distorted view of it and come to a false conclusion of it. So it obviously involves initial salvation because Satan is actively working 
to snatch that gospel of salvation out of their ears, out of their minds, so they can't hear it, or if they hear it, they hear a distorted, warbled view of it, so they don't get an accurate view of it. Uh, he's emphasizing here present tense salvation because he says right there in, in, in verse 18 leading up to this that we are being transformed. So that's looking at our present salvation and how God's working in us right now. And this blindness extends in some way to this present transforming work that God is performing to us. So what they're blinded to is some of the aspects concerning uh, this this work that God's doing in our life right now. No, it doesn't. Uh, it's not a uh, it's not a guaranteed blindness because every now and then that light does shine through to them, and that's why if you look at Second Peter. Is it for second? No, First Peter. In First uh, Peter chapter three, Peter makes a comment about this. I, I believe First Peter chapter three. This is probably work of the Holy Spirit that does this, but in 1 Peter chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 15, Peter says to, in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that's in you, yet with gentleness and respect. So here we have the fact that this light that we well, first of all, he says, be all, be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in us. So first of all, in order to be ready to do that, we have to be living a life that's demonstrating that we have this hope. In order to be ready to give an answer, we have to be living in such a way that they would have a reason to ask us. If, if we're not living, then we're, then we're not ready. But he says to be ready to give an answer. So that means that every now and then, uh, God supernaturally lifts a corner of that veil and gives unsaved people, some unsaved people at least, a glimpse of that light that is a demonstration of his life manifested in their life. And they can see that, and that makes them curious. And some of them are going to ask about that. Does that mean that they're guaranteed that they're going to get saved? No, but that guaranteed to give us an opportunity to give them the gospel so that they're going to get saved, that's an opportunity for that to happen because it's the gospel that is the power of God for that salvation. God lifts that veil so they can see that light and make them curious and, and cause them to ask us. Um, and that's, I believe, a work of the Holy Spirit. So, <clears throat> so that blindness is superseded by God. If, if the blindness was not was something that God could, couldn't counteract, then nobody could ever be saved. So in verse four, is that what the might not seen is? Verse four of, of uh, Second Corinthians four. Oh, Second Corinthians. In verse, which verse again? Uh, four. Yeah, uh, light is always a manifestation, visible manifestation of God's life in action, and so God's blinding their minds so they can't see God's life in action. The light of this gospel of the glory of the Christ. This glory is not the glory of. of it's actually you have the definite article up here. It's the light of the gospel of the glory of the Christ. No, I mean the, the that they might not see it. It's not. It's not. It's not saying. Oh yes, it's a sub, it's a sub, definitely not right. It's a subjunctive. It's a subjunctive. So there is a possibility that they can see it, and that possibility is partly related to whether I'm living it in the first place, and partly to whether God li lifts that veil and allows them to see it. And so. Isn't verse four talking about the minds of the unbelievers? Though? Uh huh. So, yeah, it's talking so about the minds. This might. I don't have my last part. Lest, lest, okay, lest, it, King James, okay. So it's a, it's a possibility that they, right. these unbelievers might see this light. Can I add a comment? Okay. So in 18, you have, we're reflecting the glory of the Lord, right? That's a mm -hmm. visual image, right? right. Um, and you have and that goes back to chapter three, the first of the chapter where letters of Christ written in our hearts. Right, right, right. So we're the only letters some people ever read, we're the only Bible that people ever write. And you, we have this ministry, verse one of chapter four. What is this ministry to live out? Christ, live out that life, to reflect yeah. Christ. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be said that when it says our gospel is hid, it's the gospel in the sense that we're living out Christ. And people see that, the how do they ignore it? If they're blinded. I think that's part of this. Not mm -hmm. all of it, but part of it. Okay. 
So it's what, what are we living out? Are we living out Christ died on the cross for your sins? And what is no. That? Yeah. No, we're living out present tense salvation. But how does that come across to an unsafe when they ask you, why are you different? Well, it goes back to the gospel of salvation. Right. That's what. Which is what Peter says when Peter says to give an answer. Right. Generally concerning his parry with the genitive, generally concerning hope. You don't tell him why it's Christ indwells me in the whole right, yeah. Don't explain that. You go if you take him back to the gospel. Right. So that's your general answer for the reason that you have a hope. Sure. Just another thing on Jeremy's question with the might there. In the Greek, all it says is that he has blinded the conclusions of the, the mind of those who are not believing for the purpose that the light doesn't shine the light of the gospel so it doesn't there's not a might or a maybe in there. it's just that the, the, so that's his intent it's the intent, intent right to keep that from it's just to be clear okay thank you that that clear jeremy okay. yes so it's not really light. that's right okay because I don't see that much. That's that that's interpretive. Okay. I know. So. But this light is is directly related to the gospel of the glory of the Christ. So that this is this is referring to how Christians function within the body of Christ, demonstrating God's life uh, within the body of Christ to an unsafe world. So it's not. I mean. It involves my individual life, but it, it's talking about the entire body of Christ has a glory to it. The entire body of Christ is designed for the very purpose of manifesting God's life. And um, that's that's uh, one of the things that Satan is blinding the conclusions of their mind to is the fact that this has to do with anything to do with the body of Christ at all. And it's not a manifestation of God's life at all. Like one of you said it was just, just you know, you're living, a, this guy's living a good life and they're just doing it better th than maybe their neighbor is, but they don't give God any credit for it. They don't recognize that God's the one doing this because they, they can't know that God is doing this. They don't have the capacity to because they're blinded to that. You have this I same idea in, in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 14, where it says, anything that comes becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, go sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine by you. Uh, this is another in, uh, passage that indicates uh, the, the life of Christ is going to, well, it says, shine by, by you. This is I think kind of a, another way of, of referring to that, reflecting uh, the life of God within our life. God shines and we reflect that life within our life. Christ shines by us. We reflect that life and uh, we have the capacity to participate in that. So, uh, so the blinding that you're talking about is uh, with uh, uh, the verse, what is the or is, is the blinding uh, to unbelievers to see that light, or or maybe for the believers to be able to shine out that, or both? Well, here specifically is, is referring to to um, unbel referring to unbelievers, but he's giving a warning here to believers, and and one of the reasons that Paul is writing this, I believe, we're going to go back to First Corinthians, is that this blinding. Is, is through Satan's methods that he uses. And when, when Christians embrace Satan's methods, they participate in what he uses to blind the minds of the unsaved so they can sell, themselves can become, in a sense, blinded to it. They, you, you try to teach the average Christian about what the truth is or what the lie is, and it just falls on deaf ears. They don't have a clue what we're talking about. And yet they have unveiled faces. It has the, the veil has been pulled away, so they have the capacity to see. But the carnal mind can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. We have that in First Corinthians chapter two. The things of the Spirit of God are moronic to the carnal mind, and that's why when Paul gets here to First to Second Corinthians, he's a, he's introduced this in First Corinthians, but he doesn't develop it in First Corinthians because there's something else he has to do in First Corinthians before he gets to Second Corinthians and deal and address this whole blindness issue. He's got to deal with their carnality, which carnality in, induces blindness. 
when I'm carnal, I can't receive new truth. I'm, I'm blind to the things of, of God when I'm, when I'm carnal. And so most of 1 Corinthians is, is, dealt, is written to deal with the first cause of their own blindness, which is self-induced blindness. It's self-induced because of their carnality. And Paul says, you can't receive the, the deep things of God because you're carnal. You're blind to them because of your carnality. And so he writes First Corinthians, and, and once he addresses the carnality, the self-induced blindness, now he's in, uh, bringing some, some light to bear on satanically induced blindness. But you, you can't deal with satanically induced blindness until you deal with car carnality, self-induced blindness from carnality. And so go back to uh, First Corinthians. <clears throat> in looking at, at these this question what are they blinded to well we've kind of addressed that but looking at at um how does satan do it he gets them thinking along the lines of how satan does it when he writes first corinthians and he does it right at the very beginning of the book in first corinthians chapter one <clears throat> verse 10 oops, that's romans first corinthians chapter one Verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind, in the same judgment. For it's been reported to me by closed people that there's quarreling among you, my brothers. Here we're dealing with carnality. Uh, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So he actually starts introducing them to the idea of satanic blindness by what their carnality does. And that may not be obvious at, at the outset, but he's going to start talking about uh, immediately after this, he goes into uh, verse 20, where he says, who is the, who is, where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the, of the world system? He talks about two different different avenues of philosophy. You have the philosophy of the age and you have the philosophy of the world system. And individuals that are embracing specific individuals over another within the body of Christ are individuals that are embracing a type of philosophy rather than the word of God. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> when Jesus was on the earth and when he was nearing the end of his ministry in John chapter 12. Uh, one of the things we've looked at several times, so I'm just going to reference this so you can look back to it if you want to. One of the things that Jesus said was that uh, when he, what he had completed, uh, he, complete, he he spoke the words that God the Father had given them, and he said everything, he spoke every single word that the Father had given him, and he spoke in the way that he wanted him to speak. He uses two different words there to indicate uh, words, the message spoken, and the way that message is presented. Now, he was the son of God, is the son of God. Uh, he knew the mind of God. There's, uh, he, he had at his fingertips a, a mind that was perfectly in harmony with the Father and the Holy Spirit and knew exactly what needed to be said. And he also knew exactly the way in which God wanted things to be, to be said, the way, the mannerisms. I don't know that, you know, we have this, this idea of permeating Christianity for the last several decades. You know, what would Jesus do? Well, I don't know. How would he present this message? I don't know. He's not here. I can't ask him. He, he's not here teaching it. I can't watch him do it. I have no idea how he would emphasize the words. I don't know what words he would use. Perhaps he would use different words. The point that he's making here with, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Each human being, because we have a different vocabulary, a different uh, upbringing, a different events in our life that have brought us to where we are, we each, when we're presenting the word, whether, and I'm not talking about teachers necessarily, although certainly that's emphasized, but every single believer, when you're presenting some aspect of God's word to another individual, saved or unsaved, you're going to present it in a certain way. And if somebody else came along, given the same opportunity, you could present the exact same message, but you can wrap it up a little bit different in a slightly different presentation. And, it's, and, and one presentation is going to appeal to one person or over another. And that's why people, Paul and Cephas and Apollos and Christ, they weren't divided. They were preaching the same message, but each of these teachers wrapped that message up in a different way. They had a different personality. They had a different vocabulary. They had a different method of delivery. Some were perhaps more forceful. Some were 
more reticent, different methods to present it. We see that all the time. Uh, Dale Spurbeck is an individual that we mention all the time. Is an individual that uh, for a long for for a long time, a long time, a while. I don't know that it was a long time, but for a while, I kind of discounted his teaching because I had a hard time following him. He, you know, I, I would tend to fall asleep when I tried to listen to Dale teach. But if I once I finally recognized what he, the content that he had there, the, the wrapping was hard for me to get through. But once I got through that wrapping, I found that there was a whole lot more substance there than a lot of other teachers that had wrapping paper on their messages that were that was a lot more appealing to me. And so the message was his presentation. The message, the content was no different than any other teacher uh, that that uh, that he associated with. But some of those teachers wrapped that presentation in a way that that captivated my mind better because of the way I am, the, the thing that appeals to me, the things that I like. That would attract me in a way that that this person's teaching did not. But they were teaching the same thing, but it was wrapped up in a different package. And that's what Paul says is the, the message isn't any different. The message that Paul, Cephas, Peter, uh, Peter, Cephas, uh, Paul, Apollos, Christ, the message that they were preaching is the same message, but it's wrapped up a little bit different. And some of those, and when you start making divisions that God doesn't, doesn't make, God doesn't recognize a, a division there because the, he sees us uh, unified in the body of Christ. But when he sees, when we make the distinctions, we begin uh, making, opening the door for these very things that, that Satan uses to uh, get his methodology inserted within the, within the church. Uh, this person's philosophy appeals to me. And so I'm going to embrace this guy's method this guy's message, the way he, he teaches uh, the, the wrapping paper is more appealing to me. And so that becomes the focus rather than the message. The wrapping paper becomes the focus, the emphasis, rather than what the wrapping paper contains. And when that begins to be our focus, when the wrapping paper is more important to us, we become susceptible to those ministers of Satan that he wants to bring into the church that have really nice wrapping paper, but the content is tampered with. That's why he says in Second Corinthians chapter uh, four, he says we haven't tampered with God's word. We haven't used clever. Uh, what's the words that he uses there? He says that's in chapter four. He says we haven't used uh, cleverness to tamper with God's word. We haven't used uh, gimmicks to peddle. God's word. We haven't, Paul says, we haven't done that. But some ministers of God's word do. They, they wrap the word up in such a way, and they twist the word in a way so that they, they tamper with it to try to, to uh, for whatever their purpose is, whether they're trying to get more money out of you, whether they're trying to get more people in the so they can get more money, uh, they, to make themselves more popular, whatever it is, a, a lot of Christian uh, ministers of God's word, they, they tamper with the word to, to make it more appealing in some way. So they, they, they meddle with it. Well, that's exactly what Satan does. But Satan meddles with it to an extent that that word now becomes poison. You know, we, we talk about tamper-proof, uh, tamper-resistant bottles, and they kind of annoy us as adults because we try to get into our medicine bottles, and they're so tamper-resistant, we got to get our kids to open them up for us because we can't get into them. <laughs> well, God's Word is not tamper-proof. Uh, the message uh, that contain, that's in the Word, I mean, God, it's, it, God hasn't... Uh, now I'm not going to go down that road, but the point is... Uh, God's word is written in such a way you can make it say whatever you want to, if you want to tamper and you want to peddle with it. And you have God's ministers who are tempted along that line, but you also have Satan's ministers that weasel the way into the church and they tamper with God's words too. And the difference is, can be just the degree of tampering. So we have within uh, this, this, um, the realm of religion, just in the realm of unsaved. I pulled this off uh, the computer. These are just four. Now, this is in the realm of what we would call them cults, but they're gonna, I'm going to use them to, to uh, make a point in a little bit. 
we had this one group <clears throat> that was um, begun by an individual back in started his his transformation started in in 1820. Now this goes to uh, how long this period of time is. You know, we talked about this this era stands for it, where they're blinded, and this blindness is a completed action. Uh, it's an era stance, but that completed action can be in a moment in time. And we're going to see an illustration of that. And that trend, that, uh, that um, conclusion that they come to can be over a period of time, but it's a conclusion that they come to. And once they've made their conclusion, then they take Satan's method and, uh, message and they run with it. This began in 1820 when this individual was determined to know which of the many religions he should join. He encountered a passage in the Bible instructing who lacked wisdom to ask God. So he was praying and in, the, in a secluded portion of woods so that uh, he wouldn't be distracted. And uh, he asked God which uh, church he should join. And according to his own statement, while he was praying, he was visited by two individuals. One claimed to be God the Father, the other claimed to be Jesus Christ. And he was told by both of them not to join any church. Well, three years went by, and after three years, uh, he was visited by another person who claimed to be an angel, and you could probably guess who this angel claimed to be, the angel Moroni, and who told him of an ancient record containing God's dealings with the former inhabitants of the American continent, and then uh, he began translating this, and in 1827, he, re he retrieved this record. So he first started his search in 1820. He received a visitation in 1823 by two individuals, so he claimed, and I, maybe it happened. I mean, spirit beings can manifest themselves. It could have happened. I'm not saying he's a liar. Uh, I'm saying these individuals were lying and who they represented. Uh, God the Father and God the Son would never tell somebody not to join a church because Jesus Christ is the head of the very church. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's crazy. But maybe, maybe he would tell him not. Maybe would have to be born into right, yeah, yeah, obviously. that is the big lie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that you can join a physical church, like it's a club, it's not, it's exclusive, sure. it's only available to those who are born again. Yeah, this guy began his search in 1820. He received a revelation, supposedly, a visitation in 1823. He received another visitation in um. 1827 and began and, and made this this uh conclusion finally this this right he, he came to his 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 um completed uh belief system in 1827 so it was a seven year period of time where this this process was going on where he started his search uh two manifestations to him a third revelation with these so-called golden golden tablets and he he establishes this entire religion based on and it's a religion that's based on the lie but it takes on a form that you and i look at that and if i can't imagine even as an unsafe pe person have this appealing to me the wrapping of this just sounds strange to me and this seems like the sort of thing I'm, I was nine when I was saved, so I don't know for sure how I would view this as a, an adult, but it, it looks kind of crazy to me. So the wrapping of this wouldn't appeal to me at all, but Satan doesn't wrap his, the, lie, the lie, not his lie, his lie. Well, it is his lie, but he doesn't wrap the lie just in one package because he knows there are millions of people out there with millions of, of likes, millions of dislikes, millions of opinions, things that one of us find appealing, the other doesn't. And so he wraps the lie in many different packages. And so he has this package that appeals to this group of people. But he knows that not all human beings are going to embrace that. So there's another uh, package that he he, he wrote, uh, he, he uh, wrapped up, for the uh, put under the Christmas tree. Uh, this individual... Uh, uh, <coughs> He had great difficulty in dealing with the doctrine of eternal hellfire. Uh, he just couldn't believe that a God who's supposed to be loving could uh, send people to eternal punishment. Uh, he couldn't embrace the idea of a, of a triune God with the idea. He couldn't uh, balance the idea of a triune God with the fact that there is one God. Of course, he's trying to do this with an unsafe mind. So he's trying to do it through rationalism, through human rationale. And, and he's not able to do this. So he organized a Bible class when he was 18 years old, and by the time he was um, 
nine, not within nine years of that period of time, he uh, established the Watchtower organization. So this period of time, he, he began his search and over a period of, of approximately nine years, he formulated this idea. And of course, this idea was formulated for him, I believe. It was at least he was encouraged to go this way. And he, and he established uh, a system that embraces the lie, but it wraps it up in a completely different package than the other packages, but it's proclaiming the same message. In essence, I, you know, this one blatantly denies the person of Jesus Christ, denies the deity of Christ. The other one pretends to acknowledge the deity of Jesus Christ. They uh, they deny it uh, a little bit more subtly, but they both deny Christ for who he is, and they both uh, embrace the lie that you can save yourself. They both teach a works salvation. There's another individual who <clears throat> uh, has something completely different. Uh, this person... I've only had the experience that I know of with one individual from this group. They're not not nearly as big, but I'm including them because they're some. They're a group that I personally was involved uh, with individuals that were with them uh, when I was a teenager. This was a, a woman who studied the Bible her whole life, but in 1866 uh, she had a an accident that. Um, was life-threatening, and I don't know what the accident was, but she experienced, quote, a dramatic recovery from a life-threatening accident after reading one of Jesus's healings. From that moment, she wanted to know uh, how she had been healed. She read the Bible and prayed for answers. It became clear to her that a spiritual healing was based upon divine laws of God and spirit. She proved that these laws could be applied by anyone to heal every form of human suffering and sin. So her, her teaching revolved around this, this so-called idea that Christ is not a person. Christ is just a divine essence that each one of us possess Christ. And it's up to us to develop that divine essence within each one of us. So it's another way of, 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 uh, of espousing the lie that I can be like God. I actually have the divine, every human being has the divine seed within them. And we just need to awake that divine seed within us. And we actually are, are already divinity within ourselves. We just need to awaken to that effect. And that person was anybody want to guess who, who she was? Yeah. Mary Baker Eddy, Christian science. Yeah. Each one of these espoused the lie. But these are the wrappings that these come in are vastly different, and they appeal, appeal to vastly different groups of people. There is one other that we're going to, because this is actually has probably the greatest impact upon us ultimately. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, another woman who um, was hit in the face when she was nine years old with a rock. I see Jeremy grinning. <laughs> Not because he threw the rock. Okay. <laughs> he, he knows who I'm talking about. Uh, what? Okay. Uh, she was hit in the face with a rock and disfigured. Um, she <clears throat> later said that that was the best thing that happened to her because she began uh, searching for um, comfort outside of, of physical things. At 12 years old, she had a conversion experience because she got involved with a group of people called Millerites. Millerites were incredibly uh, legalistic group of individuals that um, that were more than just legalistic. I mean, they said that that only you could only get saved if you were a Mill if you joined the Millerite group. Uh, but anyway, they a large group of these individuals broke off and uh, followed this lady in establishing a whole new religious movement. Uh, know who they are? Seventh-day Seventh Adventists, yeah. Is that the same as the Latter-day Saints? No, Latter-day Saints are Mormons. Oh. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, Seventh-day Adventist, <clears throat> that was Ellen G. White, <clears throat> and she, <clears throat> it's interesting about, and the reason I'm, I'm putting these as, as ones we could be most closely associated with is because uh, this group is the most subtly uh, influenced to Christian, genuine Christian organizations because of the fact that on the outside, a lot of their teaching might sound like it's biblical. They place a lot of emphasis on um, the Bible. On what? The Old on the Old Testament, yeah. Uh, 
But that's the problem. <laughs> Their whole Christian life revolves around the Old Testament. And this transformation that Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is, does not take place in the Christian life who's living according to Old Testament standards. If you're trying to live by some kind of a law, Hebrews makes it clear three times in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, chapter 9, chapter 10, Paul says in the book of Hebrews, you cannot be brought to maturity. Maturity is what this transformation process is what he's talking about in 2 in, uh, first Corinthians, first Corinthians, uh, Corinthians chapter 3. We are being transformed. That transformation process is, is our maturing as we are becoming more and more, uh, changed more and more into the image of Christ. We're, it's a maturing process. But Hebrew says the person living under law can't do that. Now, the, the Seventh-day Adventists are doubly dangerous because on the now, I don't know how many of us know this, but they are actually originally classified as a cult by fundamental Christianity. And if you have or had one of Walter Martin's, uh, he wrote a, a book, Kingdom of the Cults. If you had one of his early editions of Kingdom of the Cults, he listed Seventh-day Adventists as a cult in that book. And that sure raised the hackles on a whole lot of people and it raised a lot of hackles on people that weren't even Seventh-day Adventists because they preach Christ. Well, the reason they did that is because Seventh-day Adventists, they uh, actually taught, and I don't know if they still do or not, I, if they just changed their teaching so they could be removed from Walter Martin's book, or whether they just buried these teachings a little bit deeper so that they weren't quite so obvious. But they used to deny the deity of Jesus Christ by claiming that he's Michael the Archangel. <laughs> That's what they taught, at least originally. Now, whether they still do or not, I really don't know. What? Not anymore. But that's how they started off. And that's why they were classified as a cult, because he was just Michael. That sounds a lot like Mormonism to me. <laughs> but the um, point is, uh, that, has that has evolved over the years. But they also taught that Christ didn't bear our sins on the cross. You know who, who was ultimately going to bear our sin in eternity? Satan that all of our sins were going to be put on Satan and he was going to bear our sin. And he turned. So, so actually <laughs> Satan becomes our savior. He's the one that he, they actually called him our scapegoat. Satan would be our scapegoat to bear our sins. So Satan becomes our savior. Um, Satan wants to be like God. He, he wants to bear, he wants to be, get the credit for it. Uh, that's seventh day Adventism, how they got their start. Now, if they may not embrace that now, but that's what their foundation is. Now, if we want to throw all that aside because they don't embrace that now, well, I can accept that. But the danger that we have with, with Seventh day Adventists is, is the fact that they take a, the scripture itself, same Bible we use, and use, go to the same Old Testament we use and bring that into the New Testament and make that doctrine for practice with the church. And that process stunts the growth of believers so that we cannot be we cannot go through that maturing process of course they do yeah yeah that's because that's because god's method of using the truth says that only god can do it which is by grace and satan's method is you can do it yourself and if you can do it yourself that requires some sort of physical effort for self salvation for personal salvation every one of satan's systems uses some sort of legalistic means of doing it because it emphasizes you the same thing that satan said i will make myself like the most high satan wants you to believe that you can make yourself like the most high you just gotta grit your teeth and dig your heels in a little bit deeper work a little bit harder sweat a little bit more and if you're by golly, do it really, really hard and with real, real sincerity, eventually you will. And you might not even do it in this life because some of Satan's methods say, well, if you don't make it in this life, that's okay because we'll make allowances in the next life that you can continue this process. And God says, no, it happens here, it happens now, or it doesn't happen at all. <clears throat> now, that's in the realm of, of religion, primarily with the, the area of of. Uh, unsaved but and we're going to look at next week somehow of how this creeps into uh religious systems that actually impact this even greater than the seventh day adventists do but there's one other thing that I, I i have to mention here because this is probably the second greatest important way in which satan uses his methodology <clears throat> 
Uh, reason being is because are all, are, well, this is a kind of a loaded question. Are all human beings fundamentally religious in some way, fundamentally religious in some way? Some would argue that yes. That that's yeah, they they all follow some some form of rules or regulation that fall under religion. Religion, sure. Even atheism is a religious system. You have, you have to believe that you have to no believe that God doesn't God, exist. Yeah. <laughs> religion atheism is a religion that believes that there is no God. <laughs> That is still a, a, a belief system that, that it's a religious system. They religiously, if I can use that tongue in cheek, they religiously work to uh, promote that type of philosophy. Uh, but there is a group of, uh, a large group of individuals that some of them consider themselves religious, some don't. But this, this method that Satan use, uses appeals to both. And uh, so what, what I'm showing through this is that Satan, because he knows there's such a vast difference within human beings, such a vast difference of, of uh, types of individuals that he needs to appeal to, to sell his product to, uh, he's got a, a, a problem. See, see, God doesn't have a problem with it because uh, we have something in scripture called the election and God knows that all of mankind would reject him on their own. And so God has determined to save some of us anyway, and he doesn't rely upon us to do it. It's not up to us. It's not up to my effort to save myself. It's not up to myself to keep myself saved. And it's not up to myself to uh, get my final salvation delivered to me. That's all work from God. The, the difference being in my present salvation, I can participate in that, but I don't author any of it. I, I'm not the originator of any of it. And so everything is from God. And that's where the truth comes in is recognizes that only God can do this. The lie steps in and says, well, you can do it yourself. But because you can do it yourself, we all have different opinions. As to what I like to do, what works I want to do, what works I, I don't want to do. And you get, so Satan has organized an entire system to sell his, his product to, in a way that appeals to all of mankind. Now, even though all of mankind has a religious nature, uh, not all of mankind even recognizes that they have that. And, and so uh, there's another group of individuals that appeals to both classes. And <clears throat> this is a system, part of the system that he's engineered that we call education. I'm going to read this statement concerning general education. <clears throat> general education courses are required classes taken by students in, enrolled in traditional uh, degree programs at accredited, at accredited academic institutions. Accredited means that other human beings have, uh, have accepted these as, as being uh, necessary. And he says what these are necessary for, the purpose. General education courses are typically designed to teach different skills that every person should master in order to lead a productive life, become a knowledgeable citizen, and communicate ideas as a useful member of society. That's what education is, general education is designed to do. So if you want to be a productive member of society, you will get an education. That infers that if you don't have an education, you are what? Not a productive member of society, or at least if you are, well, maybe you are. For, you're you're certainly not as as uh, useful as some. You're not as valuable. You don't. You're not as useful as somebody who does have a degree. So we have this echelon of of, of um, value ascribed to human beings based upon whether they they have an education or not. And if you want to lead a productive life. Uh, you can't do it without an education. And so we, we push, and Christians push this ideology. We've, we've swallowed this bill of goods that if you want to lead a productive life, you've got to have an education. And this education is defined by individuals who have excelled in Satan's systems and are promoting Satan's systems. So which system are they going to promote primarily? Satan's system. General education courses. Now, these are courses that are, are generally required to get a general education. Arts and humanities. Arts and humanities uh, involve introduction to music. Well, music sounds pretty innocuous, doesn't it? I mean, after all, music gives us such, uh, s such things that are completely harmless as, I did it my way. Uh, music gives us such uh, things that are harmless as, uh, songs that dedicate them 
to um, Ave Maria. See, music is completely harmless in God, in Satan's system. So we can we can go with music um, and introduction to philosophy. That of course takes is, is or courses that that take the word of God and denigrate it to a position that is just another idea that people have, and, and it just gets buried in this mass of, of opinions out there. And if you put in a search engine for Google, how many philosophies are there in the world? Oh, Lord. <laughs> how many philosophies? I actually did that. It's a really big list, and I doubt if it's I doubt if it's inclusive, <laughs> but there are several hundred topics under this. And so the Bible is just one of those topics, and it's buried in there. So uh, that's part of the general education. English literature and most of the greatest so-called uh, aspects of, of English literature are individuals that are in some way agnostic or atheistic or and another class analyzing and interpreting that literature. Analyzing and interpreting literature in light of a mind that rejects the God of the Bible, of course. Foreign language, uh, rarely anything wrong with that. History. History. Uh, throughout its entire premise, denies the Bible. I mean, you, you try to take archaeology. They don't. Some archaeologists are now just finally starting to recognize some value to the Bible, but traditionally the Bible has been denigrated as a myth and by historians. And so uh, history, as a part of general education, does not acknowledge the Bible as history in any way, shape, or form. It's just another myth like um, the Epic of Gilgamesh or um, many of these other so-called uh, things out there. So, so history uh, denies that. Mathematics and science, well, certainly biology and geology, how more anti-Christian, how to anti uh, God can you get than uh, biology and geology that promotes? So are you advocating illiteracy? Not at all. Not at all. I'm so saying that we should use the... You know the education, hmm? music, all those things, commerce, hmm? is all part of the system. Of course, and God says to use the world system and not yeah. abuse it. I'm saying that I'm saying that Satan has engineered this world system, and that's what he's incorporated into the system, and that's what the system endorses. Whether, but am I endorsing illiteracy? No, because God says to use the world system, but don't abuse it. So recognize that that stuff's out there, and yeah. make sure you filter out the garbage. You take what's beneficial from it and filter out the garbage. Just don't don't em embrace everything that this system offers, because if you do, you're going to end up with a philosophy that rejects Christ and rejects everything to do with, with uh, what God has to design for us. We have to run it through a filtration system. And I am equally opposed to Christians that, that um, protect their kids from all of this stuff because kid Christians that go out of the world system are going to embrace all this stuff, whether they go to college or not. We're going to be faced with aspects of this in every part of our life. And Christians need to learn how to develop a filtration system to deal with this stuff properly. This is the filter that we have to use to do it, but we have to, to recognize that much that this has to offer has to be taken with a grain of salt or rejected uh, out of hand. Yeah. Isn't that the, the idea that you talked about the filtration system is framing your mind? Framing your mind. Um, on things about the way that position in Christ and this stuff is filtered through that frame of mind that you're in. And this is the filtration system. If this contradicts this, then this goes in the wastebasket. And it doesn't. I took a philo, I mean, a, a logic class in college. I had to to graduate, get my degree. Was it one that I got a great grade in? No, because I did not embrace his theology. <laughs> if you want to, it was a theology. It was a it was a theology of, of rejection of the Bible, but I was required to take it. I still passed the course because I could do the things necessary. Uh, some some of the things involved in that logic class didn't have anything to do with the Bible. All that came up frequently because that's what everybody in the class wanted to keep, keep bringing up and, and argue the points. But the point is, I had to take it to graduate to get my nursing degree. Does that mean I have to? I can't get a nursing degree because I have to take a class as part of a system that denies the Bible? No, I took the class. I passed it with what I needed to 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 get my degree, but I didn't endorse it wholeheartedly. I would have got an A if I had it. I had to settle for a lower grade because some of this I just plain couldn't accept within that class. But I still could take the class. I just had to run it through a heavy filtration system. So does that answer your question? How I, I stand on that? Yeah, well, I I know how. Yeah, but it's just, yeah. you know, 
Sure. Sure. Point being, within this system that Satan has engineered, this the lie permeates every aspect of this world system that Satan has organized. And so this is why God tells us in no uncertain terms, don't love the world system. And if you do love the world system, stop loving it because the system that Satan has engineered in its entire overall, not every single aspect of it, but overall, the system that Satan has engineered embraces the lie that, that, that he is marketed. And so God says to use the world system, but don't abuse it. So we need to filter the world, the, everything that the world system has to offer us, everything involvement that we are involved with in the world system through God's word and recognize that this system that he has endorsed, that he has designed as appealing as it may be, as some of those ideas may be really appealing, some of them may really uh, stimulate our imagination or our thoughts and, and our curiosity. Um, God warns us that the system as a whole is diametrically opposed to his plan. We're a part of the system. We live in the system. But God says, don't be engrossed in the system because it was designed by Satan. And overall, it's opposed to the things of God. That, that's the point of this. But the, the world system itself, education, is not the end all. Like I said, religion is another major way that he uses. But he doesn't just use false cults. Those are primarily designed to uh, tickle the ears of the unsaved. But he also gets his people involved in the church. And that's where this is going, looking at, at specific doctrines that affect um, Christians that um, interfere with this, this process of maturing, this process of transformation. Uh, Satan gets his uh, ministers within the church. And so I would say the wrapping that Satan uses to, to wrap the package that he sells or tries to sell uh, people like you and I has probably got the prettiest wrapping paper of all because it's the most difficult sell that he has. Uh, trying to find some method that appeals to an unsafe person, that's not going to be all that difficult. Uh, you get a group of people that like antique cars, well, you, you wrap it up with some old gar stuff and, and you slip your message in there and, and they're going to swallow because they just like old cars. I mean, that's a stupid illustration. But when you get people that embrace the Bible, that have a face that has been unveiled, yet Christ, uh, Satan still wants to uh, hinder that life from being manifested, that light that demonstrates the glory of the Christ. He still wants that to be hindered even by Christians. And if, if he wasn't interested in hindering that, he wouldn't be putting his ministers within the local church. He's trying, he deceives Christians as well. And he, he spreads a message that is appealing to Christians. And that is dangerous to you and I, yes. So actually it's something that I've said um, thinking a lot about just because of a person that I listened to recently. And I don't have an answer. I don't, I don't, you don't need to answer right now because we're getting short on time. But so this particular person is not saved. Um, however, over the last couple of years, has actually, because of <coughs> um, his, and I'm, I'm not going to say belief, but just what he speaks, because he will say that he doesn't, he calls himself an atheist. Although when he was pinned down this last time, he said, I only call myself an atheist because I can't call myself a Christian and I don't uh, 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 associate with any religion. And so it's just easier to say I'm an atheist. He believes the Bible is truth. He could quote chapter and verse. He understands the gospel. He explained Adam and Eve in a way that was you know, in the, the deception of Satan and, you know, all of this stuff. Um, but yet his explanation, which I'm still like, where does this fit? Because I know you're talking, where does this fit in that? Is it him or Satan? Um, but his explanation is, is he's on the autism spectrum. And he just thinks that because he's neurologically different, he just doesn't have that need for a hope or that need for, like, that's kind of how he sees it, but he's really not even sure, but yet he acknowledges it's true, but won't call himself a Christian. 
that comes down so, to the first Corinthians 15 passage. It says, Lisa, without capital, without, yeah. without yeah. void. Yeah. Because that's a historical thing. He believes it's true. He has a historical thing. He thinks it's true, but it doesn't have anything to do with me. With me. I don't want to yeah. understand exactly. it. Well, I don't need it. Yeah. That's, that really isn't too unique. That's how I grew up. Okay. I grew up with all that. I believe in Jesus, God. I believe God. I believe Jesus. I believe all that stuff. But it didn't have anything to do with me. I was a good girl. <laughs> You know, within First Corinthians 15, when he talks about believing in vain, in that whole chapter, what is dealing with the gospel of salvation, there's three different words for vanity, uselessness, used in that passage in reference to the gospel that will, that will prevent the gospel from having any effect. And uh, so one or all of this, one refers to an absence of power, reducing the power of the gospel. One of it is to reduce the, the, um, the substance of the gospel. And one of it reduced, removes the object of the gospel. And we understand what those three objects are that are removed. We can see how uh, twisting the gospel around in any way, shape, or form empowers one or all of those words that render the gospel ineffective. And that's, like she said, that's what, what he has done. It's ineffective to him because it doesn't apply. That is no power to me. I, I don't have the needs. And that's because the Holy Spirit's job can overthink it. But the Holy Spirit's job is to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts me that I do need the gospel. But uh, we'll wait over here. Father, we do thank you that you, you reveal these things to us and you reveal them to us because Satan still does have uh, a dangerous. Uh, can have a dangerous effect to us. He, he has uh, ways of, of influencing circumstances and he can influence our thinking. He can uh, influence the conclusions that we come to and cause us to uh, come to improper conclusions concerning the Christian life, concerning you and your purpose. If, and so Father, it's important for us to be vigilant. And as we look at these things, these things don't just apply to the unsaved. It's blatant, it becomes blatantly obvious for us to see how he works with the unsaved. But the way he works with us is oftentimes much more subtle because he has to work around the word of God with individuals that perhaps have a greater working understanding of the word of God. And we, that makes it more difficult, but he's smart enough to do that. And we need to be uh, diligent and aware of his devices so that when we can when the throws them in our path we can recognize them for what they are and put on the proper defensive posture put on the armor and uh, squelch the, those arrows and put them to flight and it's because of your power and your name and your grace